sharing screen now, we're just going to jump in and have a quick look at some of the work that was submitted last week. Um, so not everything is going to be looked at in the review because obviously that would take quite a long time given the number of people in the class. Um, but I do need to raise certain points of learning um, because obviously if those aren't pointed out it's very easy to go on making the same mistakes so I do have to flag those up um, and where possible I will reply back to you in a private comment for work you've submitted so it's always important to log back into the assignment then you can see if there's private comments waiting for you there okay so we'll make a start so last week, one of the things we looked at was the Colour Levels project. And you remember, we were using levels and targeting individual colour channels in order to bring up the saturation where needed. Okay, so we'll see how we got on with that and see where there were issues along the way. Um, so first up, I've included Ian's before and after. Um, Ian, the version on the right, is that how you remember it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, the end, the very uh, doorway at the end wasn't quite as bright as that. It was, um, but I had I had to suffer. I had to allow for that to get the rest of it in. It wasn't very well lit. It was in an old house we went to somewhere in America. Okay, so it's quite a warm colour temperature that version on the right, but given the yeah, well, it, 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 it was artificial light. So. Yeah, yeah. Given the current lighting and not much uh, natural coming in from the side windows, perhaps. So it's as long as it's you know you feel it's kind of keeping the integrity of the original image, and you're happy with the result. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, the one on the right is more, is more is more natural than the one on the, the one on the left. I, I needed to bring out some detail in the shadows as well. Mm. And you've certainly done that. Okay. So good work yeah. there, Ian. Um, a beautiful image which uh, Jonathan has submitted. So one of two. Yeah, other one, Jonathan. I replied back in a private comment. Um, so this one in particular, really stunning. Anything to say or what your findings were? Are you muted, Jonathan? Um, I'd actually used this one once with you before and your yeah. criticism was that the grass wasn't the right colour. So I tried desaturating the, the grass this time mm. more. And I think it's it's come out better. Yeah, it, it's, it is. It's a beautiful image. And it's nice to sort of rem keep that image integrity so that we haven't got anything that's kind of too brash or just not what you'd expect to see given the current lighting situation. Um, so all of that is very much in keeping with what you'd expect to see. So excellent work with that, Jonathan. Well done. <laughs> Amazing. Sorry? Thank you. Yeah, amazing when you compare your before and your after. Um, so quite quite a striking difference there. Yeah, um, I think that's the benefit of raw images. It just really saves the detail. Yeah, yeah, so right. Um, Ken Moore, absolutely loved this. Anything to say about your treatment of it? Because I know you have carried this forward and you've done uh, colour levels and tune saturation, haven't you? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I well, I, I just thought the the water was fairly still, and this was a, a lovely reflection in Sal Shields, and I just uh, I really loved the the sort of abstract pattern it was making, and um, and uh, for for the the work I did with the um, the sort of the hue and the saturation, um, and a, a different image. Um, I really went wild on some of the uh, sort of saturation because um, it really jazzed it up. And, and since it was sort of an abstract thing, it, it didn't have to look like reality. Mm. 
Yeah, we've got that coming up a bit later when we look at the, the other project choice. So um, this I've shown this one just because it's very different from um, a lot of work that's submitted. And it's really just to illustrate how, you know, you can actually use all manner of different images for these projects. And that's something that's very abstract works really well in this case with lovely, uh, lovely colour and much improved. Um, Mary, this was your one. Were you happy with the results? Uh, yes, I was. <clears throat> I tend not to do an awful lot of the colour adjustments because um, I'm always happy with, usually happy with what I get out of camera with the, the Nikons. Um, but I did want to tone the greens down a little bit, so mm. really that's... And a little bit on the bird, but yeah. It's, it's much improved because that background um, where we've got the suggestion of trees looks almost like ICM in the background and then you've got the sharpness of the bird yeah. and that lovely vibrant colour and it's so much more evident in the image on the right than the one on the left. Um, so yeah, really very striking. I think I'd be inclined to take out that branch. Oh, I, well, I would have done it all, but I've had an awful week this week. So. Oh, it sounds like it, maybe. It sounds like it. So, yeah, given given the yeah, circumstances, you've done very well. <laughs> um, David, so I've included this one um, because I'm not quite sure if I've got them the right way round. <laughs> it wasn't really clear which was your before and after. If you sort of lightened and add a little bit of colour, I think this was his star image on the left, but I could be wrong. Are you there, David? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it didn't make a lot. A lot of difference because um, I couldn't really shop and um, bring the detail out in the in the duck. Um, but the image on the right is the one with the adjustment because I played around with the blues a little bit mm, and yeah. made the water a little bit bluer. Yeah, but the, um, yeah. I didn't. It didn't really. I wasn't really that happy with it to be honest. Um, Was it a raw just, file? Um, I think. Uh, yeah, it's just that really, you know, the duck detail, the head um, is, is particularly lost in shadow. Um, so, you know, if you had like a good quality file to start with in the raw interface, you could have used the adjustment brush just to bring up some of that detail by lifting the shadows. Um, so we will yeah. do a little bit of work, you know, um, where we, we have that type of issue to fix. Um, so, yes, you have got some, you know, detail present in the feathers, etc. Uh, but you really need to see more detail on the bird. And, you know, to do that, that's kind of the preparatory treatment you do in RAW, you know, if you haven't uh, managed to lift those shadows. But I do like the water. Um, Margaret Daly, so a stunning image here, again different subject matter, um, so it really has brought the reptile to life, um, we can appreciate all that lovely colour and texture of the skin, the eye is more lively, so excellent work here. Anything to say? Um, no, no I, was, um, I was very happy with it to be honest with you and Rizal. Mm, yeah. Um, I have had done other images um, of that lizard, not that one. Um, and I mean, it, it, the colours are like that. They really are bright and they do zing. So I, I was happy with the end result of that one. The only thing I would suggest to improve further would be to clone out some of the distraction where we've got this yeah. bright green in the background because yeah. it does tend to pull your eye away from the lizard yeah, yeah. into the background yeah. well you've got a lovely image there um and that would just be the icing on the cake yeah 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 definitely i agree yeah excellent work there that's really lovely um so others if you have submitted something in color levels as i say just check on the comments to see um what's been said uh, colour hue and saturation. Um, Ian, this is your one first up. Um, can I just ask what your thoughts were on this? Well, 
the original thing was um, I needed a bit more saturation in it, and I I possibly oversaturated the red on 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 reflection. As I said at the time, I was um, I wasn't I just had a COVID vaccine, and I yes. wasn't hundred <laughs> percent. So uh, you'll you'll have to excuse me on this one. I, I had the vaccine on, on. I normally do my homework on a Sunday night. I had the vaccine on the Sunday morning, and by the Sunday evening, I was feeling a bit shaky and shivery. So it was a bit of a rush job. Mm. But uh, the one on the right is more how it should be. Yeah, yeah. So more like that, but just toned down a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the original, that is the original, but the, the, I mean, the, I think when I first did, I it was overexposed. So, um, you know, the, the one on the right is more how I remember it. Okay, that's good. So, yeah, it's just really to be alert to, you know, the power of a lot of these tools and techniques that it's very easy to cross that fine line. And sometimes if you go too far, you don't always realise it if it's a gradual process. So often using your history palette and just stepping back a few stages, then you can actually see if you're improving on what you had before or if you've actually crossed that line and you've gone too far. So, and you know, as part of my work, workflow that's something I always do just keep going back to make sure that I haven't gone a little bit too far with any of the tools and techniques it's just that re that rear um that rear red feather is I've probably just slightly overdone that but the the, the neck and the back of the bird is is correct mm, yeah okay that's good um, next up, we have Jonathan. Um, so again, a different genre where the techniques have been applied. Anything to say about this one, John? Yeah, I, it's actually overdone. I yeah. thought I'd read it again. It's I, I've gone just a little bit too far with it. Yeah, um, it's improved from the original, but it's it's a little bit overdone. The blues aren't realistic. Mm. Yeah, it's really the sky that sort of caught me first of all, that caught my eye. Um, so yeah, it's just like a, an example where you've just got to be that little bit careful because it's very easy just to push it too far. I do like the lovely effect in the foreground though because that just makes the lighting look beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was actually a lovely day. Um, it's looking across Ool's Water at Helvellyn. Mm. It's, it just... It just needs to be taken down a little bit more, maybe with selecting and masking so I don't lose the colour on the hills and just lose a bit of the false colour on the water and the sky. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head with that. So that would, you know, just really lift the colours, um, but do in, in a realistic way. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Joan, have I got these the right way round? Um, the one on the left is the one I think I can't remember now. Uh, it just it, it wasn't right really <laughs> it wasn't really clear if you'd started off with a more subdued original and then you'd boosted it, or you'd started off with a one that was really quite colourful and you toned it down. Because of course you can go either way with these techniques, so I wasn't really hundred percent sure which way round it was. Because both of them are very appealing images. Because obviously the, the one on the right looks more saturated. Yeah, I just didn't like the orange glow. Mm. Okay, so are you saying this was your original and then you pulled it back to the one on the left? I think so. Yeah. I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still a very good image of the bird, <laughs> whichever way round it is. Um, next up, David, anything to say about this one? Are you muted, David? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Um, yeah, I just, I just tried to up the saturation on, on, on well, I probably overdid the reds a little bit, but it was something like that. And I tried to get a little bit more detail in the, in the, um, in the, in the darker areas. So if you went in closer, you can see the detail a little bit better than you could, mm. than you could do on the photograph on the left. Mm -hmm. um, 
I like the green as well. I mean, it just gives the grass a little bit more vibrance. Mm. Um, so that was definitely a, a raw, um, the, the picture was taken um, in raw, and then I adjusted it in camera um, uh, to a JPEG. And then from there, I took it and uh, adjusted it again from okay. there. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, you know, it's it's a really nice start image that you can bring out, um, in whichever way you choose to process it. Um, but as you mentioned, the sky's just a bit overcooked. Yeah, I just liked it. I just it was just 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 my personal yes. choice. I just I thought I thought probably other people wouldn't like it, but I thought. Oh, you know what, I like it. So, so well, that's good. what counts, David. At the end of the day, yeah. that's why we do this, go through all yeah. of the pains to produce a work yeah. of art. <laughs> yeah. Please yourself. Yeah. That is the most important yeah, well, thing. Well, that's what I, 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 that, that, that was the idea, and um, I quite liked the way I sort of drew a little bit more detail out of the darker areas. Mm. Okay. Uh, so I was quite reasonably pleased with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the main thing. Um, then Mary, we're, we're back to birds again and the reason I've included this one is just to showcase that the adjustments that you make can be quite subtle. You don't have to really bring the colour up so that it kind of totally pops, just enough to enhance the colour on the birds and just create something that's a little bit warmer. So, you know, it's all of these images that I'm showcasing just now, there's a point of learning from each one. Um, and so that's the point to take from this one. Anything to say, Mary? Uh, really, I chose that one because because we were under a green canopy of trees. It was a, there was a lot of green in the image, and I just wanted to take the green down and then bring out the the, the red in the birds a little bit. So um, that's what I did, and just darkened down the the area on the right hand side where which wasn't in shadow, I just took that down a little bit. Mm. Very effective processing. I do like the effect that's been achieved in the background. That's really interesting, but not too distracting. And then um, the birds are standing out so much better now. So that's really good. And it's kind of an example of selective processing where when you start, perhaps you've got an idea of where you want to go with an image and how you want it to look as the end product. And so that's always something quite good to keep in mind. And again, it can stop you from going too far. Um, so Ken, this was your one um, for the colour levels, hue and saturation. And so we've got the three now where you've experimented by just going um, a little bit further with colour. Uh, yes, the one on the left is the original. The one on the right is the uh, where I've upped the, the saturation on the colours. And and then I believe it was the cyan that I, I moved all the way, just about all the way to the right for the middle one. Mm. To, uh, and which which turned the green just about a day glow green and, and uh, really intensified the uh, the blues there. So I really liked that effect. Yeah. I, I thought it was a, a stunning thing for again for for something that didn't have to to uh, represent reality. And so. Mm. So it's a good example of when you can push the sliders quite away in order to achieve different effects. Um, so you're not actually comparing it to reality, as Ken's saying, um, but a really nice triptych that's been created there. So well done, Ken. Thank you. That'll be good for our competition, Jane. We've got a triptych in three competitions time. Okay. <laughs> so, so there you go. <laughs> Right, so that was just taking a look at some of the work from last week um, because there's been a particular point of learning. So now we'll move on and take a look at our first project. So this project, it's all about lighting and what we can do to improve the lighting in a scene. Um, in this case, we're going to create a bit of lens flare just to warm up the overall uh, colour temperature that we're looking at and just make the image a little bit more engaging. So the start image for this 
um, you already have is the RT lens flare and that is opened in the layers panel so that's on the background layer which as always is locked by default so I'm just going to simply press command G on the Mac, control G on Windows and that will duplicate that background layer uh, the next step working on the background copy layer is to go to the filter menu and we're going to go to filter and then render and we're going to choose lens flare has anybody used this filter before? No? no. Okay. So we'll have a look at what it can do. Um, so the what we can actually change with this type of filter is the type of lens that is, has meant to actually generate the lens flare. And also, so that is one of the, um, the variables we can change. The other thing is how bright we choose that lens flare to be. So you can see the brightness is really quite powerful. So I'm just going to take that round down to between 125 and 130 or thereabouts, just because we don't want it to be too bright. Um, the next thing we can just have a look at the, the type of lens. So by default it's on the 50 to 300 mil zoom. Um, if I click to choose a prime lens you can see the difference as I move down. So 35 mil prime, the 105 mil prime and a movie prime. So you can see how you can tailor the flare to start with so you don't have quite as much work to do. Um, more often than not, we tend to just use the default, the 50 to 300. But, you know, if you're experimenting with your own image, just be aware that you do have the choice of the other different lens types to work with. But once we've done that, we click OK. And now we have the flare appearing in the image. So the lens flare has produced a very white light. Um, so that is something we can change with our gradient tool. Just move that ever so slightly. Okay. So we can change that with the gradient tool by simply pressing G on the keyboard. Okay. Once we've done that, we can click on our foreground color to select it. And because the overall temperature is kind of all the warm shades, we're going to be looking for something along the lines of a nice sort of warm orange. So um, I have got a hex code which you can type in here if you want to use that particular hex code. Or you can just click around till you find the, a nice type of warm orange. Okay. Um, 38504, that's got a bit missing. Let me just go back. Yeah, that's nearer it. So um, that's quite a good hex code. So it's given us that really nice warm glow in the image. Right, so once we've got our nice warm orange, we can click OK. So now we've set our foreground colour to the warm orange and we've got the gradient tool selected and then in the options bar we can see what type of gradient that we've got and um, so if your gradients are all closed up go to basics to click to open up the basics panel and what we're actually looking for is foreground to transparent. So foreground being orange, so it's going to be an orange gradient to transparent that we've selected. Once we've done that, we're going to choose the style of gradient. And so for this one, all of these are the styles we can use. So we've got the straight up and down, the linear, we've got the radial, the angle, reflected and diamond. So these are all different types of gradient we can use for different jobs. For the lens flare, initially we're just going to use that radial gradient. So once we've got that radial gradient selected, we're going to go back to the layers panel and click to select a new layer and then we're going to simply drag from the lens flare and then we're just going to keep to draw a straight line and drag halfway down the picture space so our lens flare is here we'll hold the shift key down and then we're just going to drag down our picture space and that's just giving us 
quite a nice sort of orangey blob in the middle. So obviously that has to be changed. So in our blend modes, we're just going to go down through the blend modes and then we'll be looking at a nice soft light. So that's the first thing to think about um, and that's created that nice glow. Uh, to emphasize the effect, um, you can always duplicate the layer. So I'm just going to Command J in order to make that a little bit stronger. And then I'm going to create another new layer. Because we're doing selective adjustments on different layers, we can always go back and just reduce that layer opacity if it's a little bit too strong. So we'll keep going and then we can return. So I'm going to create another new layer, um, again, using the gradient tool, but this time changing the style of gradient from um, our radial to linear, just by clicking in the options bar. And then we're going to go to the right corner of the image, top right, and then we're just going to drag down di diagonally across. So just go down approximately two thirds of the way. And again, that's putting in that really nice soft effect. So again, we tone it down. So back to our blending modes and choose soft light again. So we're starting to build up the effect. And then same thing again, pop in another new layer. We've still got everything set up. We're using linear again. And then from top left, we drag down about two thirds of the way or so, and then we get that really nice glow, and then we can change that once more to soft light. So we're just building up the effect very gradually. And then <clears throat> from here, we can flatten the image. Um, so if we wish to stop here, we could, but if we want to make the colors a little bit more saturated, just going to flatten that right now and then I'm just going to pop in a hue saturation adjustment layer. So from here in goes the hue saturation and then you can just boost the saturation again when you're working on your image just do it by eye so you might not want it to go too far it's really dependent on the color temperature within your um, your monitor just so that it, it looks right for what you're doing. Um, if this appears too saturated, you can always step back and pull back what you've done so far until you sort of get an effect you're pleased with. Um, so you can move around that lens flare as well. Once it's set in its position, um, if needs be, you can just move it to a different part of the picture space, depending on where you want that light source to be coming from. Okay, has anybody got any questions on that? Jane, how do you move it? Is it just, do you have to move it as... At your first level when you put it on? And then uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So once you've actually got it, we'll just bring bring that up. Hold on a second, I can't put that on top of there. We'll just bring that back. Yeah, so you can position it within the box. So bearing in mind, I've introduced a second one just to answer your question, Jonathan, but you can see how I can move it around the box and how it's having an effect on the base of the image. So you can see as I move it in the foreground, we're getting that lightning effect coming through as well. Yeah. Thank you. And why did you bring the two in diagonally and just instead of just bringing straight in from the top? Um, it was really just to, because we're going from foreground to transparent, so I'm just bringing in a little bit of a glow on the right and the left sides. Okay. Yeah, so it's not really um, spreading out quite the way I would like it to. Um, if I just went down centrally, so I've already got that central section, then just bringing it in from the sides just gives you more of a, a rounded glow, if you like. Thank you. Right, so if you haven't got any more questions, would you just like to have a little go at that project now, please? If I've saved them, Jane, if I've saved the image, what's the best way to put it side by side with the original? Right, so 
Um, if you've saved it with a new file name, just go to Window, Window Menu, Arrange, and then because it's in portrait format, just choose Tile All Vertically. Thanks. Right. Are we done or do we need a bit more time? A few more minutes or...? Which one are we doing next, Jane, so I can load the images up in Photoshop? Uh, we're going to do the Land Rover Composite. Thank you. Is everybody ready to move on or are we still busy? I'm fine. Yeah? Everyone fine? Everyone's thumbs up, nodding? Okay. Right, we'll move on and take a look at our next project. So I'll just close down the RT lens flare. Um, so this project involves, a, it's a composite technique. So um, we have done a little bit of work with composites before. Um, we've got the Land Rover image and we've also got the mountain image. So it's really just to make this a little bit more interesting uh, because where the Land Rover image is at the moment isn't that interesting. So the Land Rover image is to the fore and then we grab our move tool so the shortcut for that is V and that's V for Victor and we can just click and drag that image into mountain so hold down the left mouse button go up to the tab of mountain and then just click and drop the Land Rover image into that mountain image and then just place it so that it fits within the scene okay so now in the layers panel we've got our background which is our original mountain and then on top of that we've got the Land Rover image so we're working on the Land Rover image and this time we're going to be using our pen tool so pen tool very useful when you need to select areas that aren't really that uniform um, or areas that uh, uh, just don't actually fit in with any of the other tools. So it's not dependent on kind of contrast to pick up edges. The pen tool um, is one of those tools that you can basically just go with and then you, you're more or less dictating where it's got to go. So I'm just picking up my pen tool and then just going very quickly for demonstration purposes and then creating quite a rough selection around my Land Rover. And you can click and create curves if you wish. So we're isolating the Land Rover from its background. So we just basically click around and then just click over the foreground area. And then once we get to a straight bit, we can click, click, and then we finish where we started. So I've made this line red, as you can see, and so it's quite a thick line, so it stands out and you can see where we're working. So that's working on the Land Rover layer. Then we can press either Command and Enter or Control and Enter, and basically what that does, that turns our path that we've created into a selection. Then if we pop back to the layers panel and pop in a layer mask, that has now cut out the Land Rover from the background. Okay, So once we've done that, we need to think about tidying up the shrub area. So because we've added a layer mask, we can just paint on that mask. So we'll be using black as the foreground colour. In the toolbox, we need to select our brush tool. And then in the options bar, we can just take a look and see we want a fairly soft brush for this task. So we can take the hardness down quite a bit. Um, and then you've got the left square bracket to reduce the size of the brush um, or the right size uh, bracket if you wish to make that brush a little bit bigger. Um, and then we're just going to brush around on the mask just to tidy up the shrub area and just to make sure that that's nice and neat. Not an awful lot of work to do on the mask because most of it's been done with the selection. Um, next thing we are thinking about doing is popping into our new adjustment layer 
and then we're going to just choose brightness and contrast and then we're going to increase our contrast in the properties so properties just above that adjustment layer and then we'll just boost that contrast a bit again you can do this by eye around between 40 45 percent should work quite well um, but we just want it to actually affect the layer below rather than the background so as you probably guessed we're just going to pop in a clipping mask just to restrict the effects of that brightness and contrast layer to the layer below so if we click on that that's just clipped that to the layer below and so we can see that small icon indicating that the clipping mask has been applied at the top of the layers panel we're going to pop in a brand new layer and once we have that in again we're going to activate the gradient tool so the gradient tool is the four so I'm pressing G and that activates that gradient tool um, in terms of gradient we're going to use the um, in the basics panel it's going to be foreground to transparent and again we're going to be using the linear gradient and once we've got everything set up we're going to drag the gradient from the base of the image so if we just pop down the base of the image hold down the shift key as before and then we're just going to drag that gradient up to approximately the level of the foreground rock obviously that is quite dark so we just need to make it a little bit more subtle so to do that we simply go in the layers panel and then we can just take that down between 50-55% so it just darkens that foreground nicely um, we can change the blending mode as well so I'm going to change the blending mode of that layer just to improve that slightly to overlay because I quite like the effect that that's giving and then overall um, we might be thinking about adding some warmth to the image so we're still on the top layer so any new layers we're going to add are going to come in above that layer too so in the new adjustment layer we're just going to come down into photo filter um, this is just really to give a nice warm up effect and um, the default for that is 25% so I'm just going to change that so it's higher so it's more or less warming everything up on a global scale so that's approximately 60 to 65 percent I'm not so keen on what's happened to the sky though but as we can see that adjustment layer has come in with its own layer mask so we can press B on our toolbar to bring up the brush tool if it doesn't work immediately you can just click on the brush tool then in the options bar just make sure again we're working with a nice soft brush and then we're needing to paint at quite a low opacity so I've just got 20% um, opacity there and then we can just paint to bring back some of the colour into that sky the more you go over it obviously the more you're going to make a difference with that as you paint on that layer mask okay so that is the next project for you to have a think about and that's creating the composite using two images and working with a few different layer types so we've worked with the photo filter we've worked with just a plain layer brightness and contrast and also working with layer masks in each of those cases. Has anybody got any questions on that? Yes, Jane, I managed to have a little play with this earlier. And when I got the pen tool, it went, when I clicked it on the edge, I got a line going in two directions. Right, so just if you go to the pen tool in the toolbox, just make sure that you've got the ordinary pen tool. Now what happens with the pen tool, if you click and drag, you see here, I've got the line going in two directions. Yeah, yes. can you see that? Um, yes. Yeah, yes. and so this is like a special feature of the pen tool. Oh, um, right. Yeah, it, it's in order to create curves. So it's used for some quite complex um, selecting where you create a Bezier curve, say an archway. Um, that would right. be a Bezier curve and that's why the tool allows you to click and drag and set points right. yeah right. Um, right. so 
So I just need to click and then click rather than click and, and drag. Yeah, just to keep it simple for this to select the irregular area. I mean, you could try using another selection tool if you don't like the pen tool, but the pen tool no, is, no, yeah, it, it is very no. useful. So no dragging. Fine. If you just go click, no click, yeah, you'll find it works Fine. a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you. And Jane, whereabouts is it you click to add the layer mask? Just in the bottom of the layers panel, right here. It looks like a little TV. Can you see that there? I'm pointing to it. Oh, yes. Thank yes. you. Sorry, I couldn't find that. Thanks. No, it's just when you've got all of the panels docked, um, it's actually right near the bottom, so it's very, it's hard to see it sometimes if it's sort of, you know, um, hidden. So, yeah, that's oh, where it is. You. I'll be back in a moment.
Right, how we're getting on with that? Any problems or is it pretty straightforward? Straightforward. Oh, excellent. That's good. Everyone's very quiet, so I assume we're all still busy. We all look very busy. <laughs> when I moved the land, um, the land Rover into the mountain thing, there was a huge image, and I'm having trouble locating the transform tool. Control T didn't seem to do it. Uh, what you can do, Ken, is just minimize what you're working on. Are you on a Mac? Uh, no. No. Well, if you're using Windows, just press Control and minus. So if the image is taking up like too much room, just press oh. Control minus minus or go to the yeah. toolbox where you see the hand. So you should see the hand icon. If you double click on the hand, it will make the image fit on screen. Okay. And if it's still too big, just press Control minus minus, so you can make it small enough to get the transform controls and pull it in. Okay, thank you. Jane, I've just struggled with the bit where it says um, to, uh, paint on the layer mask with black. I just can't seem to select that like that single layer. Right, so when you're working with a layer mask, um, so this is the layer one layer mask, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so just make sure that the focus isn't on the Land Rover. So if it's got a border around it, the focus is on the Land Rover. If you click on the mask and you get the border around that, that's where you're actually working. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, and then, yeah, so you're painting with black to conceal the effects on the top layer, white to reveal. So you can paint with black, and then if you make a mistake, you can paint with white. So right. to paint with black, you need to have black set as your foreground colour, the focus on the mask, and then you can just paint. Right. Jane, when you're doing the, the gradient tool and you talk about opacity, um, that's in the layer panel, isn't it? Not in the toolbar for the gradient tool. Right, so let me just see which bit that you're up to. One second. Right, so you're dragging the gradient up from the foreground of the image, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And when I when I did the opacity at the top, at the gradient toolbar, it didn't seem to make much difference. So it then went down to the layers. Yes, and yeah, that's what... That's right. So it's the layer opacity that we're adjusting. So we do it at full opacity to see what it looks like, and yeah, then we yeah. judge, oh, yeah, need to take it down. Yeah. So if you... What's that... The opacity that's at the top of the screen that's related to the gradient tool, when, when does that operate? Uh, well, you can use that instead. So that just, oh, right. yeah, that so just, so yeah, it's there. just applying to like the tool opacity. So, you know, if we're using the brush tool at like 20%, that would be yeah. the tool opacity. And then in the layers panel, it's the layer after you've actually done something to take it down right. the oh yeah. Right, right, thank you, thank you. Jane, I'm painting on that layer mass with black and it just seems to be revealing what's underneath. Yes, that's right. 
So when you're saying when the mnemonic goes, it's black to conceal. So you're concealing the effects on the layer above. And it, what it inadvertently means is that you're showing what's underneath. And then if you paint with white, then that covers up what it is that you've just been painting. Okay. Jane, with the photo, sorry, somebody else. Jane, with the with the with the photo filter, yeah. we've used it for warming and density. Is is that the main purpose of the photo filler? Is to warm or cool an image, warm or cool an image, and then how dense it's it's becoming or not? Um, yeah. So if you look at the photo filter, there's a whole range of different oh, filters right. you can apply. Yeah. Um, right. you, yeah, to get different effects, um, and then of course you can change the color. So yeah, with, yeah, yeah, by clicking on the color box, and then yeah. the yeah the density yeah. yeah. So in fact, it does an awful lot of things. It it does filter. yeah it does a lot of things and it's really useful. Right, thanks. Now, how are we getting on with that? Oh, have we got a little bit more to do or are we done? We're done? Everybody's finished that or not? Um, yes. Yeah? Thumbs up? You can always, no. you can always see, you know, behind. yeah, if you, if you want a few more minutes, um, you don't have to just hurry on the next project. It's always Just two best. more minutes, please. Yeah, that's fine. It's always best with Photoshop to focus on quality rather than quantity. Make sure that uh, you, you know, get a good job done and then ask those questions. Then, of course, this is all being recorded, so you can play back and skip through the boring bits when uh, you have a look later. I might just finish this later because I, I had to start over. Oh, did you? Oh. Yeah. I, I, I dragged the wrong image into the, into, the, into the other image, so I, I had to start over. Okay. So we'll, we'll just give this one another couple of minutes, uh, just so that everybody's got a chance to finish what they started, and then we'll move on. And Jane, is a, is a clipping mask the same as a layer mask? No, no. Um, no. So they're, they're two very different things. So a clipping mask is when you just want to apply the effects to the layer underneath. So this is the clipping mask set up here. So the underlying layer is always underlined, in this case layer one. And so yeah. we're applying brightness and contrast, but not to everything not globally we're just applying it selectively to where we've clipped that layer to and so it's just being applied to the Land Rover image so the layer the layer mask is has got a global effect so if we just had an image made up of like these two layers then if you're painting on the layer mask then it's going to apply to the whole of the layer um, so for that, would you just sort of select that um, clip, like like that photo of the the Land Rover with the squares in the background, and then go to adjustments and add it that way? Uh, to add the the uh, clipping mask. Oh, you mean yeah. Uh, so you add the clipping mask. If you wanted to just make changes on that one to affect the layer beneath, 
if you hold down the alt or the option key and hover between the line so you have that dividing line between layer one and background if you hold down the option key and then just hover to where that line is you get that funny little icon with the bendy arrow and if you click on that that puts the clipping mask in I think that's worked. Thank you. Jane, I, I've got a basic problem. I've tried this several times. I can put the Land Rover under the mountain. I can do the pen around it, but as soon as I press Command or Control and Enter, it, the selection just disappears. Right. So when you do it, are you on the Land Rover layer? I think I am. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So you you've just dragged the Land Rover into the mountain, and then yeah. you should you should be on that active layer, and then oh, yeah. yeah, when you you select your pen tool, and then yeah. it looks the same as my one where you've got the path going right round. Then in the yes. options bar, it's uh, on path. And then it's on, because you're on a Mac, it's always command and enter to turn a path into a selection. And it just wipes it out. The other thing I was wanting to ask you is, um, if you start at the side, the left-hand side, and go around, you brought the line to the bottom right-hand corner. Yes. But as far as I remember, you didn't bring it across and round, or did you? Yeah, so you needn't to join up where you started. Well, yeah. that's what I've done, but then the next stage, it fails. And then it, it, the problem is that the path won't turn into a selection. That's yeah, what, yeah. Yeah. And, um, but it, 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 I'll try it again. Yeah, because um, you can always right click. When you've got the path created, and then choose uh, turn path into selection. Ah, um, right. So I might try that. Yeah, you? just try that because we might have to explore further. Have you had any other problems with uh, like selection techniques or using selections, or just the uh, pen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll have another bash. <laughs> you have another go and then just make sure you're on that Land Rover layer. Um, and if yeah. it doesn't work, we might just have to look yeah. into it to see why. Yeah. Jane? Yeah. When I was using the pen tool, it's created this this yellow fill which is filled in the area around, uh, inside my selection is that supposed to happen no <laughs> no so look at the options bar and in the options bar you can have shape path or pixels okay ah. so just make sure that you've got path ticked you ah. had path ticked didn't you Doug In the options bar. Not sure. No. Uh, yeah. So it it tends to be t um, selected by default. So um, as I say, you've got shape, and that would fill it in with like a solid color. Pass, which you turn into a selection, or pixels. Oh, yes, it's physical. I can see it. It's picked, yes. Yeah, it's past, past the one that you've got. Okay. Yeah. Oh, would, have you had another go or, or not yet? I'm just doing it now. Okay. Yeah. Very crudely, just to, yeah, to just see. Yeah, just to see. Yeah. And then just look in the options bar and check it's got pass then make selection and then you've also got mask and shape and auto add delete just to make sure those things are there yeah okay and then when you've gone round and made a little path choose make selection that's 
like make selection, let's see. There it is, yes, that's 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 worth chain I think. Ah, yeah. good. Right. How we doing now? Are we we're there or we're not there? A few more minutes, are you ready? All right. I'm fine. Okay. Right. I'm fine. Okay. So for, for the next one, um, we're just going to have a little look at HDR in Photoshop. So for this one, um, I've just gone into Adobe Bridge. So I've got two images selected. So um, I expect you know the HDR technique lets you combine a set of exposures into one image that basically expands the dynamic range beyond what your camera is capable of. Um, and we can do this both in Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, and so both software will merge a set of exposures for you creating quite a large 16-bit HDR raw file. Um, so it basically means you can create a file without the overcooked effects that most of us stay clear of. Um, so any high contrast scene can benefit from the HDR treatment. So you may have three images, you might have just bracketed your shots and taken one at normal exposure, one at perhaps minus one, one at plus one, and then you can carry out this merge. Um, in this example, two images were sufficient to capture detail because we've got a very bright sky and we've got a dark foreground. Can I just ask, is somebody not muted because we've got a bit of funny sound coming back? Ah, that's lovely. Sorry, Thank okay. you. No problem. Jane, uh, yes? Uh, uh, Jane, I've never used Bridge before. How do you get your images into the bridge? Right, so with Adobe Bridge, this is basically like the file management side of um, Adobe and you get this with your photographer's package. So you've got Adobe Bridge and you've got Lightroom and you've got Photoshop. So basically on the left hand side, that is showing you, um, that you would see in Windows Explorer, the contents of your computer. In the central part, that is just showing you the files that you've got selected. So for example, um, you could go to computer. Um, so here I've gone, clicked on computer. Um, I've double clicked on my hard drive because that's where I've got sort of quite a lot of images have been saved. Um, and then you can just basically scroll down um, until you find the, the actual folder where you've got your images saved. And then you just basically navigate to those images the way you would do in um, Windows Explorer or in the Finder on a Mac. Okay, so the benefits. Okay. Yeah. What if you don't have Bridge installed on your computer? You uh, use Lightroom, so you only use one or the other. Well, you can use both. Um, so you can, within your, your programs that you've actually got installed, you can use Lightroom. So I'll jump between Lightroom or I'll use Bridge. So once you've paid for the package, you know, um, it's quite good to use both. So what's really good about Bridge is you get really good metadata. So if I click on um, an example, HDR01, then it's given me a lot of metadata about that particular image. Um, and so that's why I really like it. You can also use the expand slider, so you can expand on the size of an image. Um, so it and also, you know, you can just sort of view the image full screen. So when you're analyzing photos, it's quite useful because you can see the image and get all of that data up in a very quick way. Um, so it's will we not be able to do this. Um, tutorial if we don't have bridge installed and um, oh yes you can you can still just open up the images within adobe camera roll okay so i'll just show you the the method that's outlined in the handout so basically we're just opening or selecting the two images then right click and then you can just choose open with so if you're working from bridge that will just be open with um, Photoshop and that will take you into Adobe Camera Raw 
um, but you can just double click and because it's a DNG file the native raw format if you double click on one it'll just open up within the raw interface well, I'm just selecting both of them and because I've selected both I've now got both open within Adobe Camera Raw um, so this is the film strip we can see down the left hand side so I can press command A or control A in order to select both images so whatever I actually do is going to affect both files at the same time um, a lot of the work's done in Photoshop apart from the merge but you could just as easily import these into Lightroom and then just select them select both images then right click and then just merge to HDR so it'll work in both it depends if you want to have a go with Adobe Camera Raw if you've not used it before um, so once we've got that in and we've got those images selected the uh, best thing we can do is just to go to detail uh, within detail we're checking sharpening and um, just to make sure sharpening is at zero so it's always better to sharpen the merged file once you've done all of the work so that's just in the details section and um, next thing we can go to is optics so very important remove chromatic aberration and use the profile corrections so we can do all of that within optics just to make sure that that's fixed um, the HDR merge will cancel any previous tonal adjustments that you've made so it's better to merge the frames first and then adjust the, the, um, the, the tones afterwards. So once we've got both files selected, uh, just the same if you were using Lightroom, then you can just choose right click or double tap on a Mac key, um, keyboard and then just choose merge to HDR or you can press Option and M. Um, so what it'll do, uh, you can choose to align images, apply auto settings. Deghosting can be quite useful if you've, say, taken an image handheld and there can be a little tiny bit of camera shake. Um, so deghosting can work quite well if your image isn't perfect. If you haven't used a tripod um, and there were issues at the taking stage, then you can apply different levels of deghosting to see if that can save the day. Once we've done that, we'll just click Merge. And it will ask uh, where to save it. And so I'll just save it as something. And then just save it. And we just wait while that happens. And then we have the merged file, which appears as a third file within the film strip. So once we've done that, um, you can take a look at some of the presets. So we've got our new merge file active. If we go to the right hand side where we've got the presets, so we can press Shift and P. Um, and it gives you quite a lot of image looks that you can just sort of scroll down and have a look. So, um, and it's nice because you see the preview in real time as you scroll over them. So. We just have a look at Adobe at default, see what that looks like. Um, it's as I say, it, it gives you quite some quite nice previews. So basically, at this stage, you just take a look, um, explore some of the previews, and once we've done that, um, we can just click to open within Photoshop. It's just busy carrying out that merge now, so I'm just sort of Hurrying it up a little bit, it's not quite done yet. Jane? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I got, when I got uh, Photoshop, I got Adobe Creative Cloud. And you can select Bridge as one of the options in Adobe Creative Cloud. I don't know whether some of the other people know that. Right, uh, so you, you got the photographer's package, did you? I suppose I did. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Bridge comes with that for free. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've, never, I've never used it before because I didn't know what it was. Mm. So it's it's definitely worth exploring. I can do like a little tour of Bridge next week if um, you'd like to know more. Um, as I say, I use it quite a lot. It's very good for teaching just because um, of some of the features it's got. You know, it is feature rich and very good file management and very good on the metadata. 
So once we've got our merge complete, I can choose open. And then that's just going to open up in Photoshop. And then once that's open, we can do a little bit of work on fo in Photoshop. So I can press Command J or Control J on the Windows machine to duplicate that background layer. Um, and then I can just basically check the image at 100%. Um, so if we zoom right in, I just press Command and 1 on the keyboard. And then we just have a little check around to see if there's any um, spots on the sensor or any artifacts or anything that really shouldn't be there. Once you've done that and you've done your check, you can always just dodge and burn. So you can use the dodge tool to lighten and if we right click on there we can use the burn tool to darken. So any areas you want to draw attention to you can use that dodge tool. So perhaps you would lighten a little bit of the foreground area. So those of you that have done the previous course and um, seen the waterfall project, uh, that is sort of an example of dodging and burning to lighten parts where you wish to take the viewer's eye to and then darken parts where you perhaps don't want to make areas quite so visible. So that is just an introduction to merging our images and um, using Bridge in order to access the file management side, selecting the images in Bridge, and then going to merge those images. Okay, has anybody got any questions on that? Jane, I'm sorry, Bridge, as with Bridge being so completely new, um, could you just go through, I understand now how you get the images how did you get the two? Is that just with um, with shift? Uh, to select two. Yeah. 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 So when when it comes to selecting images, if you wish to select files that are adjacent, so files that are next to each other, you simply click on the first one, hold down your shift key, and click on the second one. So that will select files that are adjacent. If you wish to select files that aren't adjacent, you can click on the first one and then you can use either command or control to cherry pick which ones you want to select. So if you want to select more than one, you can use um, your control key to cherry pick. Control P? Uh, control key. So, P yeah, uh, no, no P, no P, control key. So it's the control. Okay. Yes. <laughs> It's my accent causing problems. So it's yeah, con control control key. <laughs> okay. Control key. Thank control you. key. Key. Yeah. So whenever you're working with file management, if you say working with Windows Explorer and you want to select a whole bunch of files that are next to each other, click on the first and then hold down your shift key and click on the last one, then that'll select a whole bunch. Okay, so that's files that are adjacent and then just use with Windows the control key or with the Mac use the command key if you wish to cherry pick. Uh, uh, Jane, I've got a couple of questions mm -hmm. um, on that. Um, uh, you know, you said um, if you take three photos uh, bracketing and you take one at minus one, one at zero, one at plus one. Yeah. Um, you know, if you just if you're taking them without a, a tripod, the, the photograph might not quite be exactly the same. Each photo might be slightly different due to yes. the camera shape, only yeah. marginally different. But it's still okay to merge those three, even though there'd be a marginal difference. It does possibly. try, yeah, it does try to auto align. Um, so it will allow, you know, even if your, your drive mode's on continuous and it rattles off three really fast, um, yeah. when you take them out of camera, it will try to align those three images to counteract that. So when you do that, when you align them, if you still sort of think, oh, that's, they've aligned, but there's a little bit of of um, ghosting say around the mountain or something that's when you can use that deghosting command and try it on low try it on low yeah yeah right yeah that's okay and it, and it has to be with uh, obviously it, it's raw files for this isn't it so, um uh, yeah. it, it's better with raw files just because you've got that much more data to work with um and you know you've 
you might as well just go for the best quality when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah, great. I've, I've, I've just I've, I've just downloaded it now because as as, uh, as Kenneth just said there, I've just gone into the uh, Adobe Cloud and I've just downloaded onto my computer the um, Adobe Bridge. So it's, I think it's a little bit different version to yours. Yes. Um, yeah, I just opened this one quickly. Um, but, yeah, there is a new one, the 21. This has just opened its 2017. But it, it's pretty much the same. It uh, right. still still does the same, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have to have a look at that then. Yeah. But Jane, I've managed to get into the folder week two with all my things in, and I've got all the images that I've now downloaded into that folder. Is it double click on the HDR ones? Um, yeah, if you've got a DNG file and you double click yeah. on it, yeah, it'll open it up in Photoshop. Oh, right. So, right. Is that what I wanted to do? I didn't want to keep it in Bridge. Uh, oh, you're in Bridge, are you? Yes, I was. Oh, oh sorry, I misunderstood. I didn't realise you were in Bridge. So, if, if you're in Bridge, then you yeah. click you click on the first one and then you shift yeah. click on the second one if they're next to yeah. each other and then yeah. once you've got them selected um, you yes. can either right click and choose oh, open okay. yeah yeah and then open with photos yes right thank you if, if you have Lightroom you can do the same thing from Lightroom of course you yeah yeah you can well, uh, yeah, you can, absolutely. Right, um, we're getting quite close to the end of the session now, so we'll just have a look at what you have to be looking at for homework. So, um, just popping back into your classroom.